Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this video I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about the action platformer prototype I've been working on. So as you can see, I'm using the Godot engine, which is open source, and it's really nice for 2D games, particularly pixel art, because in the 2D mode, it will measure everything by pixels as its units, and all of the calculations are made in real 2D space. And so I've been finding it easier to actually achieve what I want to achieve than, say, trying to do the same thing in the 3D Unreal Engine. So I'll go ahead and hit play here so that I can kind of preview for you guys what's been going on. So you'll notice right above the character's head, we have the name of its state, currently idle because I'm not pressing anything, and I'm also showing the X velocity and the Y velocity for debugging purposes. So when I go ahead and press left and right, you can see that it changes to the run state. I can hit spacebar for jump, and that's all pretty standard for any kind of platforming game. But this was probably the first real time I was making a project where I was going to need other complicated states as well, such as attack animations, not in the game yet, and also to have states which require slightly more tricky conditions, such as swimming. So here you can see the sick swim animation I used from two of the frames of uh, the packet I was downloading. By the way, that is called, let me go ahead and check you, uh, Pixel Adventure. So if you like this kind of character, that's a really good pack to use. So why am I talking so much about the state of the character? Well, as it turned out, when I tried to stuff all of the code into the player script, basically how it should interact when it's idling, how it should transition into a run state, or what conditions it should jump on, or what conditions should cause the character to jump, or even to swim. You can put that all in the same script, but it kind of becomes a mess. So what I quickly realized is that this kind of situation is much better if you handle it with a state machine. So if we go ahead and open up my player script here, you'll see that most of the code, as far as how the character moves, has actually been completely stripped out of the player class. Instead, it relies on a state machine. So the state machine handles changing the state of the character based on input and conditions, such as being in a certain area or when the space button is pressed down. So my player is extending a custom class I created called state machine character, and I figure uh, all of the enemies in the game are also going to be based off of this. And using inheritance is going to mean I only really need to make mention of the state machine once as long as all of the characters use this class. So you can see in state machine character, all it's doing is making sure that there is a state machine attached in the scene for the character and giving it a name. So we'll just be able to use that name for any character that's going to have a state machine in order to access it. So you can see from my player scene that the state machine itself is attached to the player. So any character that's going to rely on a state machine is going to have one of these. And then under that state machine are individual nodes for each of the states. And then each of these states are going to be loaded up by the state machine. On every frame, the state machine is going to tell the current state to basically do its thing, continue processing. And when a state is finished, it's going to let the state machine know that it's time to change to a different state under certain conditions. And so if you watch so if you watch Godot tutorials on YouTube, you might actually notice that this is basically the state machine setup that GD Quest was using. So yeah, it is based on the GD Quest state machine. So if I open up the state machine, the interesting thing about it is that the actual details of how a state runs, basically what should happen during idle, isn't set up in the state machine at all. It's mostly just a container that actually holds all of the states and can switch between them. So you'll see right here that I set up some code to initialize the state's map. So rather than manually typing it in here, I just have the state machine. Go ahead, take a look at the list of children states, making sure that they are in fact state objects, and then adding them into the map. And then from there, you can see that it picks a default state based on this variable up here, which I probably am going to change that implementation at some point. Having it as a string seems a little bit iffy, but who knows? And then after setting up the states map, you can see it changes into the default state set by this variable up here. We'll have to see if I change that in the future. And then from there on the physics process, which runs every frame or and then from there, the physics process, which runs a set number of frames per second. I'm not actually sure of the exact number, whether that's 30 or 60 or something by default. But anyway, it, it'll work not actually sure if that's 30 or 60 by default. Um, but anyway, it's important to have the states running in this because the states do deal with fish because the states themselves are going to be dealing with physics movement, such as running around and colliding with objects. So that's why we use physics process here. 
So we can also see here, there is a method to change the state based on the name of a state. But when this is actually being called is by using a signal in Godot. So if you don't already know, signals are how in Godot, you can have one object respond to the events that occur in another object. So in this case, the state, each of the states that we add to the state machine at the initialization of it, are going to connect their are going to connect with their finished method to call back to the change state method. So the finished is going to send a string, the name of the new state to transition into. And then in this change state method, which will happen whenever this signal is emitted, is going to basically change into that state. So that's how each of your states can tell the state machine what the next state should be. In the update method for each of the states, that's where you contain all the code about how a character should run or not. So here you can see that when the character has an axis input of x that's greater than zero, it's going to run to the right at the run speed. And likewise, it'll run to the left at the run speed, basically going opposite directions with negative run speed if the x input is less than zero. And where am I getting this axis input from? Well, you can see that the run state extends the on ground state, as seen here, and that the on ground state extends the motion state. So using inheritance, you can basically set up a function like get input access to make sure that any state that is a motion state will always have access to the x axis and y axis input that you would get on a controller or a keyboard. So that's just where I get that from. And then just checking the variables, depending on the state, you can have the character move or not move. So obviously in the idle state, you're not going to have any of that run animation stuff. So in the idle state, you'll see that there's nothing here about actually moving the character. All you really have here is that if the X input isn't zero, then it should transition into the run state using that emit signal of finished with the parameter of run. And then the state machine is going to say, hey, find the run state and make that the next state. So I think why it's great to separate your code like this into different functions is just that when you have four or five different states all coded in one update script, it becomes a complete mess to look at and to figure out where something went wrong. But if you know that a character is, let's say, in the run state and while it's in the run state, something is going wrong, you can just kind of go into the run code look at this and you only have you know 15 lines to look at and debug so as an action character becomes more complicated it's going to be easier to keep track of everything and not let the project scale so as a character gets more and more states it'll be able to keep things under control because each of those states are their own separate thing and when we need to figure out what went wrong with one we only need to look at that specific state and not the entire set of code behind that character. So anyway, there's one more interesting thing uh, about what I've been doing, which is the swim state in particular. So if you're gonna be transitioning to a swim state, then obviously the character would need to be in some sort of water for that to happen, unless you wanted it to swim through the air, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So how do you know when you're in the water? And so that sounds pretty simple in concept, but it took me a little while to get in practice. So the water area in this case is obviously gonna be this giant pool of water down here. And that is set up with this area 2D. So let's go ahead and enter the scene for this. And you'll see the pool of water is basically just a set of tiles. So we have this basic blue background tile, and then this animation tile up here at the top. So those are being drawn into Godot using the tile map. So tiling is one of the things that Godot is really good at for 2D games like this. So when you have a tile set and a tile map set up, you're able to just come here, grab your tiles and draw them onto the grid. And one of the really nice things is actually auto tiling. So I made this really basic tiles and I won't really touch on it too much, but auto tiling also in Godot, really handy. So it made it quite easy to set up something like this for the ground uh, with a combination of Asaprite tile setter to make all of the combinations for the walls and the ground and the inside pieces. And then you can set the bit mask for the tile set inside of Godot. Uh, but that's enough for that right now. Let's talk about the water area. So in order to know that characters have entered the water, you have to have some kind of collision shape underneath the water area. So you can actually use tile maps as a collision shape inside of Godot. So what you do is you come down here in the inspector to where it says 
collision use parent. And that's going to mean that the parent is going to use this as the collision shape. So if I open up the tile set, we can see if I zoom in here that each of these little tiles actually have a collision shape. So you can see I just set it up as a standard square. So as long as they have that square and they're drawn on the tile map, then that's going to contribute to the water area uh, for the tile map that it uses inside of its scripting. So everything here basically you see is going to be considered water area and that's exactly what we want. But it's really handy that we can do it with tile map as well because as soon as we draw more squares that's also going to add to the water area. And it's also going to be really handy as well if we draw any weird shapes. So if I did something like this where it's not a pure rectangle, all of these tiles are still going to be uh, collision shapes that contribute to the water area. So that's really nice. And then as far as detecting when the bodies overlap as well, you can see here there's a little icon for a connected signal on the water area and in node. So inspector and then node, you can see down here that uh, I have it connected to itself with a method called on water area body entered. So basically whenever something enters the water and it's detected, then it's going to see if it's a state machine character. And if so, it's going to try to call the method add overlapping area self onto that state machine. Now, not every character that has a state machine is necessarily going to do anything with that. Like you might have a character that just doesn't swim when it falls off the edge. So it's up to the states themselves to decide if they're going to transition to a swim state or anything like that. So you can see in the state machine script itself, I have add overlapping area and remove overlapping area. Pretty self-explanatory, but up here at the top, it's kept in an array of overlapping areas. And then these overlapping areas during the physics process, you can see that the current state is going to try to handle the overlapping areas based on whatever we write in each individual state's code. So in a nutshell, each individual state can decide based on the state it's currently in, should it do anything if it happens to enter the water or enter lava or enter the air or whatever, any overlapping areas that may be relevant to that state. So I believe it's actually in the on, on ground state. So in the on ground state, which is the basis of idle and run, we have overlapping areas. And then if the body of the state machine is in a water area, then we're going to transition to that swim state. And so here's one of the places where I think the state machine becomes really useful because there might be states where we don't want to transition to the swim state. So by being able to set it up for each individual states, we can keep the states that should transition able to transition and the states that can't unable to transition. So a great example of that would be if you are in an attack animation, you probably don't want a character that attacked forward to step into the water and immediately break the attack sequence and then enter a swim state. Uh, that sounds like something that's undesirable in the game. I mean, maybe you want that and you could have it either way. But this way, it's only going to transition if it's in one of these motion states. And I don't believe I'll be basing the attack states based on the motion script. So in air, I also have the same thing. Uh, if you happen to be jumping or falling and you hit the water, then we also want to transition into the swim state. So I'm not sure if uh, eventually I'll just position this into the motion script so that all motion scripts are going to have handle overlapping areas. Actually, you know what, for right now, I'll just go ahead and do that in advance. <clears throat> if I need to change it in the future, I can change it in the future. Okay, and then we'll take it out of the in air save the scripts and as long as we save and reload it should be able to work just fine so enters the swim state just by moving the code to motion it works perfectly fine still so in a nutshell and i, I hope everything was reasonably okay to follow um, if you tell each of your states what kind of areas it's in and what kind of buttons are being pressed down by passing that information from the state machine into those individual states, whatever the current state is, then you're able to handle how it should respond for each individual state. And that makes it flexible and much easier to write than trying to stuff everything into one player script. So what I've learned is that state machines are pretty good to have around. So the next thing I'm working on for this platformer game is interactions with 
objects or characters and the environment. So the very next thing I want to be able to do is to talk to this guy here and open up a dialogue with him by pressing the interact button, uh, currently set to E. So actually I do have the interaction itself connected, so we're using signals once again. So the idea in this script, which I'm going to use as the basis for basically anything that needs to be interacted with by a interaction key, the E button or whatever. Um, when a body enters the interactable area, once again using area 2Ds, it's going to connect the player interact method, that's when the key is pressed by the character, to the on player interact. So this is going to be what the response should be when a player tries to interact with the character or object. And this function is going to be overwritten by any class that's going to inherit from an interactable. So this just sets up how it will interact, but all of the classes in the future, like dialogue or shop, are going to determine what actually happens, what kind of window should pop up, what it should say on the screen, so on and so forth. One thing I'll point out about signals, though, is make sure that when you're doing the connection, that the object that is doing the connection, the body.connect, is the one that actually holds the signal which the method is going to be responding to. So this is the object which is going to have the callback method on player interact, on player interact. So that means this method down here in this class. And then this is the object which actually has the signal that it's going to be connecting to. So make sure you don't mix that up. It took me a little while to figure out what was going wrong there. But yeah, this is the correct way to do it. So that's going to be it for this video on what I've been working on so far. Uh, in the future devlogs, I'm going to try to record everything ahead of time and then do a voiceover on top of that rather than trying to kind of talk about it as I'm showing you guys stuff. So if you guys have any suggestions or comments so far, feel free to leave them in the description below. But aside from that, I've been Chris. Thanks for watching and I will see you guys in my future video content.